Can everyone hear me? Oh, awesome. Okay, so um, let's see a show of hands first. Um, how many, we've obviously got quite a uh, diverse audience here, people from lots of different uh, job backgrounds. So I'm curious, how many people here work on or have worked on an authentication system in the past, whether it's service to service or whether it's user authentication? Okay, and then keep your hands up for a second if you've put them up. How many of you look back at the first time you wrote an authentication service and think that what you did was amazing, the security was great, you know? All right, <laughs> I think we've got one, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, going into this, what I want you to bear in mind is if you're just starting out and you're just building your first kind of authentication service, so you're building um, anything uh, security related, keep on learning and don't be put off by um, how the, uh, if you think when you're going into it you get a lot of negative feedback, keep working at it and keep looking at best practice and uh, put in the work to keep on researching. So don't be put off if you see anything that's negative in these slides. So about me, I currently work at Cloudflare. I describe myself as a polymath. I'm, um, so I, I do lots and lots of different things. Currently, Cloudflare proxies about 10% of the internet. Um, so about 10% um, of web requests route through our network. Uh, that's about 6 million websites. Um, we've got two people from the Cloudflare operations team here, actually. Um, there's uh, Zygis in the back who, about two weeks ago, um, <laughs> this is an interesting story. So about two weeks ago, we were at our company retreat in San Francisco, and I got back and I was in London. Everyone was still flying over. And Zygis works in our operations team, and he was on call. And um, I decided at about 2 a.m. on Saturday morning to deploy a major hotfix on uh, one of our legacy code branches. So, you know, I, I think I made his on-call shift quite interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the first time in two years I've, you know, um, had an opportunity to, um, to deploy anything interesting at Cloudflare, but um, not looking forward to doing it again. <laughs> Um, and then before that, I worked in um, road traffic systems. If you've ever used a traffic light, it, or if you've ever pressed a traffic signal in London, you'll be running through my code. Um, there, it wasn't as it wasn't seen on as well to start doing hot fixes at two a.m. in the morning on a Saturday. Um, and then before that, I worked in digital agency. So let's dive into it. So why passwords? Um, so when I was originally starting off in development, um, I remember I sat opposite once a um, IT guy and every time people would come down, they would come down to see him. He would basically set their, um, and his, uh, he would reset their passwords. Instead of coming up with something unique, he would basically set their password to the phrase password, but with, you know, a number zero and some dollar signs. And I asked him once, I said, don't you think this is a little insecure? And, and he said to me, well, it contains, you know, alphanumeric characters. It contains some special characters. I, just, I thought, you know, I, I, I know it meets the, the guidance you have put down, but it, it, this surely can't be bad practice. And I moved on and I um, went to another job. I was speaking to someone, um, uh, someone at the company there and their password rotation policy started being every quarter when the guidance would say, okay, so you need to set a new password on your system. They would just replace, say, Q1 2014 with Q2 2014. And, you know, that was their password recycling process. So I had this going in the uh, back of my mind. And recently at Cloudflare, I started work on a project on how we can um, improve this. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. So authentication. Authentication is fundamentally about confirming you are who you say you are. So it can be done three ways. Something you know, like a password. Something you have. Can someone give me an example of how we can authenticate using something we have? Come on. <laughs> so the face is an example of something you are, I guess, because um, something you have. Um, so take, for example, um, when I came into this uh, yesterday when I flew in at night, um, I went to the board security, I gave them my passport, and that was something I have. A more pragmatic example is if you have two-factor authentication enabled on, say, your Twitter account, 
you will get a text message, um, and that's something you have. That's your mobile device. Um, so two-factor authentication could use two um, of these various tactics, whereas um, you know, single-factor authentication using passwords is something you know, so just your password. Um, and passwords are dated, and they were introduced in, I think, 1961. I think it was the timeshare computer at MIT where passwords were originally used. And um, that system originally ended up being breached, um, and um, passwords since then haven't been replaced. Developers continue to store them badly. Users set them quite weakly too, and um, they've stayed in use, and there hasn't been a better system implemented. So why is that? Um, so if you look at the research around passwords, it's basically, um, you can find that there's no current scheme which can replace a full set of pass pa uh, full set of benefits which passwords have, um, and the reason for that fundamentally is research at the moment. The academic proposals which have come out have failed to gain traction, largely because they don't sufficiently consider the real life utilities of using um, using passwords. So, for example, whether it's the ease of implementation or whether it's, you know, we see a lot of stuff come out about using things like fingerprint sensors. Well, you know, not everyone has the hardware to do that. I mean, there's even a percentage of the population who can't really, who don't really have workable fingerprints to use. Um, so passwords have um, stood the uh, test of time purely because there hasn't been a better alternative. So let's talk a little bit about how you crack a password. So dictionary attacks. Uh, dictionary attacks are effectively, um, what you do is, some passwords are used more often than others and you use a dictionary of common passwords to, um, to try and breach them. You probably noticed I've had to kind of uh, <laughs> censor some of them. I mean, I, I don't know the psychology of some people when they just start swearing into a password field, you know. Uh, how angry those people must be, you know. <laughs> uh, oh well. Um, so computers continue to get faster, um, which means especially when we're doing password cracking offline, we can do it faster and faster and faster. Uh, graphics processing units, GPUs can, can basically um, do repetitive processes faster than most CPUs can. And um, effectively, they can just get faster and faster at cracking passwords offline, cracking um, um, hashes, um, we're using dictionaries. And to counteract that, humans don't really get much smarter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the thing is, if, for this person to have to have posted that, they must have also set a password. So does anyone you know, want to guess how secure that password is? Um, and so one of the ways um, that, was saw, uh, that uh, this tried to be counteracted was uh, password uh, composition rules. Um, I mean, getting a user to understand these rules kind of seems insane. and. Um, these types of rules are quite prolific. They'll require you to enter in, you know, uh, numbers as well as um, symbols and all the rest. But does that actually help make our passwords more secure? And the answer is no, because actually there was some research done by this um, out of the University of Canberra, and what they found was people would still use, you know, um, personal information. They would still put birth dates. They would still put names and their passwords, and they would then um, still continue to reuse the same passwords. They would use the same passwords from site to site. And this is where credential stuffing comes in use. So what you can do with credential stuffing is when a uh, password database is breached, you have, um, you know, you'll have a list of usernames and passwords for um, everyone in that breached site, for example, and then you inject those username and password combinations into a breached website. And um, even if the website tries to limit how many times you log in, even if it tries to um, challenge the amount of requests you can do, if the passwords are reused from site to site, your accounts can be compromised. Um, so you might think, okay, this is fine. Um, my site is built um, reasonably well. You know, I rate limit requests, I capture them. But really, you know, the research comes out that it's about at least 43% of people reuse their password from site to site. So in reality, it's more like this. 
Um, so next steps. Next step. How do we um, take apart what is currently bad practice, which is you know ridiculous password composition rules, users who are forced to use dated password systems. How do we make this um, overall a lot better and more secure for users? And there's fundamentally three things we need to solve here, right? So we need to improve the decisions our users make. We need to educate developers about um, what is best practice when they store uh, passwords and, what, and excuse me, when they implement rules on how they um, on how they should basically um, on use on when they implement rules about how passwords should be composed. And then the third step um, is eliminating reuse of breached passwords. So the first thing is encouraging, um, you know, unique strong passwords. Um, so I'm sh not sure if any of you've seen the X, um, XKCD comic or, um, about uh, basically password reuse. And what uh, comes out there is basically, um, you know, it, it's safer to have a password which is entirely composed of an absolutely absurd sentence instead of to have, you know, random uh, letters and, uh, and numbers which no one will remember. And then from there, you know, you can encourage password managers to make sure someone has a, ma a master pa a password, but then they can actually uh, use password managers to make sure they have a randomly generated secure password for each. Um, another thing we can do to help you, um, users make good decisions is abolish the bad practice, which is password composition rules. So um, really getting rid of those, um, those rules around minimum uh, numbers of, uh, um, including a, mi a minimum number of uh, special characters, a minimum number of uh, numbers, etc. Um, we can really do away with those. They don't do uh, much good. The same is true of password expiration policies. In reality, password expiration policies do very little good. And um, it's not just me saying that. It, advice from um, GCHQ in the UK is now, um, now their standards division kind of uh, come out with advice which says password uh, uh, ex expiration policies do more harm than good. And that's kind of been uh, corroborated by um, NIST in the US as well. Developer education. So we need to talk more about um, security and we need to do it more in simple terms. I mean, not all developers necessarily are interested in computer security. Um, not all developers necessarily want to understand, um, you know, why we use password derivation functions. They'd have just been taught, okay, you just MD5 the password, you know, um, five, ten years ago and they, then they've stuck to that. Um, we need to make sure we have a culture of security. I mean, Actually, um, whilst talking about culture of security, I remember um, a few months ago I had the opportunity to talk to someone called um, Ivan Ristik in our London office, um, uh, our Cloudflare London office, and he built the original version of SSL Labs. So if you don't know what SSL Labs is, is for sites which use you know HTTPS, SSL Labs is a site which basically um, gives you a grade kind of A plus to F on how your SSL is doing, or on how your SSL implementation is doing, rather. And um, effectively, he, he turned security into kind of, kind of a game where you would be graded on it and you could, um, you know, and people would go out and try and make it better and people would see that and they would, um, they would want to improve it as a result. He also built a tool um, called Hardenize recently, which does the same, which is basically a JavaScript kind of um, add-on for your site where you can show off how Hardenize ranks um, certain security features off your website. That is the type of culture we need to build. And part of that is, you know, a, a culture where we're happy to improve security, where we're not, you know, necessarily shaming people for security bad practice. That's absolutely critical to impro improving developer education here. Easy password hashing APIs. Um, PHP had a massive problem with password hashing and still does. Um, and what they, one of the things which happened in order to fix this was they exposed really simple um, pass, uh, password hashing APIs. There's just three functions you need to really implement in order to get really strong uh, password hashing algorithms. So bcrypt is implemented by using password hash. Um, there we are. Can you see again? <laughs> awesome. Um, so password hash is um, implements bcrypt really easily. Password needs rehash 
is when you can see that a, a hash you know has lived its life cycle needs to be generated with um, so it can withstand a greater level of computational strength and password verify is also quite important because when you hash a password um, you don't want to just um, you, you know if you've sorted it you want to make sure you can um, verify it um, and when you're using sorting you need to use a verification function also as we talked about credential stuffing earlier rate limiting and capturing abusive login requests is really important too um, and doing so will uh, limit the surface area for a user to be attacked so if your site is the one where anyone can hammer it with um, with requests to find out wh um, who has the vulnerable passwords you make um, that user vulnerable across all other sites it's not it's not good enough just to say you know this website is purely just a simple login service no because users will reuse passwords across multiple different um, uh, across multiple different websites and you need to make sure you account for that and finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about work I've done recently around eliminating reuse of breached passwords. So, um, effectively, we know password composition rules are, in, are ineffective. Um, and ideally, what we should do is we should stop um, users from signing up when a password has been found to be breached. When it's posted online um, in a database um, when a site is hacked, um, users shouldn't really be allowed to reuse those passwords. Um, and research indicates that when you actually use fear appeals, when you actually tell users that their password is breached, they are um, more likely to change their behavior. And this is also true in the latest NIST guidance. So uh, this is kind of where, where we're heading, and I think this is, this is the direction we generally need to head in as well. Um, effectively, the, this is easier said than done, though. Um, data dumps can include millions to billions of passwords. Um, Troy Hunt recently posted one which was about 320 million passwords. This is huge. You don't want to have to spin up a Docker image with you know, 10 to 20 gigabytes of passwords every time you make a login service. Um, and there are API services which exist to check if a password is reused. The problem is, is then you're trusting your user's raw password in a third-party service, and even if you salt it, you wouldn't be able to, uh, or even if you hash it, you wouldn't be able to salt the hash, because when you salt the hash, it becomes computationally difficult for you to search it. And this is something which I've been working on, and um, there is a proposal now to do this, um, which I wrote as part of some work I was doing at Cloudflare, and basically, um, there, uh, there's a proposal on how you can build um, an API service to allow developers to check if a password is reused without them even needing to send the uh, password in hashed form. It remains fast. Um, the size of data that needs to be uh, consumed is only about 8 to 16 kilobytes per request and it provides K anonymity, so there's a guarantee that it provides um, there's a mathematical property of when something is anonymous and this guarantees that. It doesn't necessarily guarantee a mathematical property, property known as L-diversity, but it can be modified to do that. And coming soon is going to be a client-facing API, some implementation examples and a demo tool. You can stay tuned for updates on that on the Cloudflare blog. And I think I finished quite early, but um, thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Sure. So there was, um, I, there was an academic proposal a little while ago for a, um, basically a plugin which would effectively hash a password and salt it using uh, identifier for a site. And when it would do that, it would then uh, basically submit that hashed password back. Um, so effectively, when you do that, um, the user has to have a certain degree of competency to know that this is a problem and then know to install a plugin to do this, unless you convince the browser to do this natively. 
Um, in which case, password managers are the more secure alternative to do this uh, because password managers um, basically force you to have to use a unique password instead of kind of covering up the issue of password reuse. Um, I, you could probably make an argument that uh, it, 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 some security is better than no security in this respect. Um, but ideally, the proposal um, I'm working on here, which is um, to offer anonymous ways of checking if a password is reused and if a password is breached, that should cover up a lot of these issues because it should mean that ideally um, weak passwords shouldn't be used at all. Does that answer your question? Awesome. Sure. Thanks for the talk. For a normal user, what would be your advice to ensure the password reuse does not happen because there are hundreds of password reuse? Is it safe to use like uh, Google Password Manager? If not, what are the options? Yeah, so definitely using some password manager is better than no password manager. Um, the general advice is, you know, have a map and master password, and then basically uh, what you, you can do is you can effectively uh, randomly generate passwords for each site. The, the caveat to that is uh, if you use a password manager, make sure you turn on something like two-factor authentication. So make sure it generates a code on your mobile phone or something before it will tell you your password, because um, that actually makes it, you know, in case your password is breached there, you, know, you, you want to have something else to protect you. And also, obviously, you want to make sure it's backed up to a certain extent, too. Um, obviously, your email password as well is something fairly critical because that can act as a single point of failure. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. you know, what would be your view on using Google like browser and password manager in many Are they safe? Um, I haven't looked too much into um, how browser password managers work. Um, I have worked, uh, I, I have seen uh, a lot of the work that's come out of the Chrome team. I think generally a lot of the stuff they produce is very uh, security centric, so purely on a reputational growth basis, they, uh, they seem to know what they're doing. But again, um, things like Chrome password manager, uh, you know, uh, there, there are potentially better alternatives out there like LastPass or one password if you want to invest in a dedicated password manager. Um, so it, um, if you can, I would probably advise you to go for one of the dedicated options. The other thing as well is if you're using um, Google's um, password manager option that's linked to your Chrome account, is then you're also potentially tying your email in alongside your passwords, which can be you know, a little bit dangerous because instead of having, um, you kind of end up centralizing a lot of your uh, password manager. Thank you, Levi.